Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name is Mary Ann, and I am an alcoholic. And y'all require two drinks tonight. I, uh, I'm very nervous. And uh, let me just tell you what I know. Uh, my sobriety date is March 10th of 1990. My home group is it's in the book in Littleton, Colorado. We meet on Wednesday nights at 6.30 in the Littleton Adventist Hospital. Uh, so please come visit us. Um, and I just have to say it's very hard to follow Sarah and Adrian because rarely do people make concepts and traditions so fun to want to do, right? The right of decision. You know, how powerful is that? You know, Alcoholics Anonymous gives us great, great responsibility, you know. And uh, considering that I fit for the criteria that didn't fit in Alcoholics Anonymous early on, uh, I do have to say I'm very grateful. I have to say that I, I love you, Adrian. You know, um, I'm going to tell you this part of my story. I'm a crier. Um, at about 14 years sober, when I thought that darkness had come upon me again, I walked through those moments with my friend Adrian, and um, I did it, doors wide open, veils undone, and... Uh, and, you know, he held my hand and he walked through that period of my life with me. And, uh, and I'm very grateful for that. You know, we've both gone on and, um, we have both have babies today and babies change everything. And, um, mm-hmm. but I tell you what, you know, those moments, nothing can take that away from me. And I'm going to tell you about a lot of those moments that Alcoholics Anonymous has given me that has, that have been complete gifts from God. And that as long as I'm willing to do this deal, to do that plan that's outlined in that big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, those remain very close to my heart, and I never have to give them up. I want to thank an AA group for having me here tonight. Um, You get me in trouble in Colorado because I always go to my home group conscience and say, well, we don't do that in Utah. But I did that when I moved to Utah, and I did that when I moved to Arizona, and I did that when I moved to California, and I didn't know better when I lived in Massachusetts. So, um, <laughs> let me, you know, uh, and I love this group, and they give me the opportunity to be here tonight, and I want to thank you. And, um, you know, I, I miss them, and they keep me on my email list. I think Lori does it just so that I can uh, harass her and vote, even though I don't have a vote anymore. And, um, You know, uh, uh, tonight coincided, or this weekend actually coincided, and here's this one, the gifts of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, My partner and I, uh, we have an 11-month-old, and that's my family today, thanks to Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, we have a tween in our life. She turned 12 today, and uh, she um, coincided with being able to speak tonight. And so we got to show up Saturday for her surprise birthday party. Man, what a gift. You know, what a gift to be able to be there. And, uh, you know... You know, of my own choices, I don't show up for 12-year-olds, you know. And, uh, and you know, an Alcoholics Anonymous makes that possible. But let me tell you a little bit about what it was like. I usually go on, and it's really boring. I have to tell you right now, I grew up in a small town the size of this gymnasium. And uh, this half were the untreated Al-Anons, and this half were the untreated alcoholics. And y'all were having a lot of fun, and you looked really miserable. So... Guess which team I joined? And uh, and I swore I'd never be like you. You And um, sorry, uh, some of you heard part of this story today. I don't know which parts you'll hear again. I mean, last night I got a chance to speak at the VOA, so you might hear some repetition uh, because it didn't change from yesterday. Um, (laughs) But uh, um. I grew up in this small town, and, and um, you know, my grandparents adopted me. There's some, we're an alcoholic family, so the story has not been, it's been told many different times, and it's all different ages, at which a point I was adopted, but I was adopted at some point in my childhood. For the sake of time, I'll just tell you tonight, uh, two years. And uh, But they took me in when I was about nine months old, and um, 
I gotta stop because I gotta say, Allison, thank you for making coffee. She wasn't gonna make coffee because there's coffee out there. Do we make coffee? No. I said, I need coffee. I got my coffee, Allison. So thank you. But in this small town, right, um, uh, are my grandparents, and um, you know, um, they took the. My grandparents adored me. Uh, you know, my uh, grandmother likes to tell everybody that my grandfather thought I was the most precious thing, that he put my socks on me every morning so that my precious little princess feet didn't have to touch the ground, you know, and uh, I was far from a princess, you know, they had no idea that, you know, I'd kissed a couple of toads and I'd been turned to, you know, the devil in disguise, I was just not the child, right, I am not the baby they held in their arms, and they thought, I'm going to love this baby, and I'm going to give this baby everything that I can. And they did. I just didn't turn out to be the kind of baby that appreciated or had very much gratitude for anything that they had to give me. You know, and um, my grandparents, the one thing I did enjoy about them is that my grandparents owned a bar. And uh, so, but small town, they only sold four kinds of beers. I wasn't very much interested in beer, but I could always trade beer for hard liquor, right? Um, so at a very early age, I learned how to change their books because I was in charge of books. They trusted me with their money. They trusted me with their inventory. And uh, and so at an early age, I learned how to change around their books so they were never missing anything, and I was always trading out what I needed. You know, I was an alcoholic waiting to happen. I mean, I was just a train wreck in the middle of their house, and they had no idea what to do, you know. I mean, at nine years old, I'm stealing from my grandparents. I'm stealing. I mean, this here's my thinking, folks, right? If... if I don't know. Alcohol made myself made me tolerable to myself. But here's my mind. My grandparents had a few video games at the local Dairy Queen. Right? I stole the money he made from his video games to put back into his video games. Right? I could have asked my grandfather for the keys to the machine. I could have asked my grandfather for five dollars of quarters. I had to steal from my grandfather. I don't know why. I just did. You know, and I stole everything that he hid. It was, I couldn't help myself. He thought he was hiding things from me. I stole it. I stole his dime collection. I stole his, all his, uh, whiskey bottles that he kind of imported from Mexico on his own. Cause my grandfather had his own little deals going on, right? I just stole whatever it is my grandfather had to hide. And, um, you know, my grandmother, uh, in my mind was a weak woman. It was a weak woman. And I'll tell you, my grandmother is the wittiest, sharpest, and can be the nastiest person that I've ever met. You know, and, uh, and I'm glad today she's on my side. You know, I appreciate having her on my side. And, uh, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit. You know, but this is the kind of child I turned out to be. There was not enough love. There was not enough material. They didn't have a lot of material to give me, but they, they tried to send me to ballet lessons, hoping, right, that I'd be the little girl they brought home. I am no ballerina, folks, right? They tried a lot of things, right? They sent me to piano lessons. Maybe I could sit upright. Maybe I could be proper. Maybe I could be something. They wanted to change me at a very early age, and I don't blame them. My grandmother always says she's sorry they taught me how to speak, right? Because I just, I just couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. And, um, you know, I, uh, my, my drinking story is really boring. That's what happens when you grow up in a town about this size because there's a cornfield over there, there's a gas station over there, and there are nine churches and ten bars in between. And, um, you know, that's what I did. I hung out at the gas station and I hung out on the cornfields. And we also had a bay about seven miles away. It gets kind of tough to ride your bike drunk to the bay all the time, right, until you're of age to crash a car or two. But that's how I lived. I lived in cornfields, and I lived on the corner of gas stations, hiding behind people so my grandparents never had to see me. I'm a coward, folks. I'm a coward. The way I do things is that I'm driving your car, and I'm drinking. I think I see my grandmother coming, so I duck. And you panic because I'm driving, right? I mean, not I'm a coward. Yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. No, 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 no. You know, my sponsor says I'm the kind of person who will say, yeah, I'll pay the price until it comes time to pay the price. You know, and I'm just backing up saying I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to. It was an accident. 
I don't know what I was thinking. And that's, um, and that's me. You know, I, uh, I came to, uh, I always lie right off the bat. I did not come to Alcoholics Anonymous. I was not happy when I got here. One of you did one of those fine 12-step calls on me, and you brought me to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous because I told I was told I, I might have a drinking problem and I might want to check y'all out. You know, and I'm jumping way ahead, but that's how boring my story is. I drink a lot. I crashed a lot of cars, and in the end, um, I signed a few documents that enlisted me in the U.S. Air Force, unbeknownst to me. I say unbeknownst to me because I came to a few days later and my grandmother was really pissed off at me because apparently I'd forged her signature and I'd signed a bunch of signatures and I'd done some things that I didn't know that I had done. And uh, Anyway, I belonged to the U.S. Air Force. And because I was, you know, and you've heard this, I think you heard this last night about my integrity and my pride. Um, there are a couple of questions for you who've joined the military, right? They say things like, have you ever engaged in a homosexual act? Well, my sister had told me a few years ago that I might be homosexual. I wasn't sure if I'd been acting homosexual or not, but she told me I was homosexual, and so I had signed no, right? It asked me if I'd done, you know, it asked you if you did drugs, right? Well, it didn't specify what kind, so I said no, right? <laughs> now, they must have been really desperate because I clearly was out of my mind when I signed all this paperwork. But off I'm going to go, right? He's probably got his toaster for the month or something by signing me up. I'm not quite sure, you know. And what's amazing, a friend was with me, and how he didn't sign up, but I did, I still don't get to this day, you know, and I haven't asked him, to be honest with you. But anyway, so I have spent much of my junior high and high school career uh, getting by. You know, and that's what my story is in Alcoholics Anonymous. My sponsor makes me tell you that my first 10 years don't count because I didn't do very much to get it. You know, I did as much as I could so that it didn't hurt anymore. But I didn't do very much so that I could grow spiritually, you know. And so I spent a lot of those years just driving a truck through people's lives. You know, if there was somebody to be thrown under the bus to get me out of trouble, to keep me out of jail... I threw you. I threw you fast, I threw you hard, and then I ran. And that's the kind of friend I was, that's the kind of daughter I was, that is the kind of person I was in your life. And by the end, by the end, the, in this small town, there were very few people to kind of burn through. You know, and um, I think the thing that makes this little tween in our lives so special, she has a brother who's a teenager, and though he acts kind of funky these days, I still love him very much, is that I, pre I remember the day when my English teacher sat me down, because remember, I've had her since seventh grade, and she said, Marianne, my daughters, who are younger than me, me, have a lot of respect for you, but you don't deserve any of it. You know? And she asked me to stay away from from being an influence of her daughters, you know? And, and I, I, you know, I had no wife to lose. I had no husband to lose. I had nothing, no money to lose. But any part of myself, any part of myself, I gave it up in a moment so that I could have a drink, you know? And I'd like to tell you that I liked a particular kind of drink. I drink whatever you had, whenever you had it, whenever I could get it, however I got it, whatever it was in. It had been drunk and puked up and spit out cigarettes in it. I didn't care. Even that nasty spit, right, that chew stuff. I drink a lot of chew, right? Because high school teenage boys like to use whatever's closest to them to spit in it, even if it's your drink. So I drink a lot of Shit, folks, right? I drink a lot of it so that I could get some relief from me, from me. And I had no idea, my family had no idea what my problem was. They did not understand, know about, ever hear about, even think about the disease of alcoholism, you know? They were always trying to do, make me do something different, you know? They made me wear socks with my shoes. They made me put a belt on. They made me get a perm, right? They thought if I looked different, I might act different. And folks, I had no idea how to act in this world amongst you, amongst you. I had no idea. 
I, I sat next to you, and I just wanted to just implode. I wanted to slither away. I wanted to be somewhere else. I wanted to be someone else. I just couldn't. I couldn't even imagine that I could look you in the eye ever. You know, so by the time I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I always heard this for a long time, and I didn't understand it, and it was, um, you know, I'm an alcoholic, uh, with the, I'm an egomaniac with an inferiority complex. I didn't get it till very recently that that's what I am, right? I'm always thinking about me, and me, and me, and then when it comes down to it, I'm not good enough. I'll never measure up, you know. My sponsor says there's a restaurant named after me. It's called Mimi's because I'm always talking about me, you know. I know you're recording this, so I'm going to say that I love my sponsor. (laughs) And I do. I do love my sponsor. Um, She's been kind to me recently, but I know it won't last long. You know, I'll tell you about this sponsor in a short bit. But let me tell you, you know, I, I was brought to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous after being very lost in that world out there and hoping that something that alcohol would fill me, would alcohol would fill me, and it never, it never filled me. And um, um, some of you have heard my story, and you know what my surrender point was. You know, my surrender is, was in October of 1989. Um, my first, uh, I don't know, it was a... It was my first moment of clarity, I guess you might say, that there might be a problem. And, um, and it was in October of 1989, it was Halloween, and I'd been asked um, to not, if I could not take a drink for a weekend, and I thought, no problem. I cannot drink for a weekend. I can, um, I'd been in some trouble. You don't know what that's all about, right? I'd been in some trouble, get people off my back. I said I'd go, I'd get some help. I went to get some help. She asked me, do you have a problem? No, I don't have a problem. My family has a problem. You should meet my dad. You should meet my dad, blah, 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 blah. Right? Don't drink for a few days. Sure, no problem. She didn't tell me it was Halloween weekend, right? So, come Halloween weekend, it's Halloween, it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and, um, um, anyway, I, I see her on a Thursday and I'm drunk till that Monday. But the moment, and I woke up, you know, still in that, that phase, that new phase of development in our lives where we think, how did we get here again? But something was different this time because that weekend, I'd gone to a costume party, and I'd worn the best thing that I had as my costume party, and that was my uniform, and uh, <laughs> really illegal, right? And uh, I, come, I came to that weekend, and we know what it's like to come to. We know what it's like to come to the strangers. Um, but I came to next to a boy, <laughs> and that is very troublesome. <laughs> for somebody who doesn't come to next to boys very often. And uh, I thought, alcohol is taking me to some new lows, right? <laughs> and, uh, cemeteries were pretty typical for me. I don't know what it is with me as cemeteries. And, uh, so I, that was my first moment of clarity that there might be a problem with my drinking. Um, it had been kind of followed by other things at that point. And um, anyway, I, I, uh, I, was, um, I was told that a, a woman alcoholic uh, could pick me up and take me to a meeting. I had no idea. If you're new, if you're, I know there are some new folks here tonight. Uh, don't worry, they have let queers in, but we're okay, right? But let me tell you, if you're new, the things that they talked about tonight make this meeting possible, right? You may not understand what it means. It may be something you think, God, I don't want to ever see those traditions in my life. I thought that for a long time. But I tell you what, what I know is that what they were talking about tonight makes these kinds of meetings possible. And we have a responsibility to Alcoholics Anonymous. And somebody took that responsibility in that 12-step, and they picked me up, and they took me to a meeting. And I didn't know where I was going or what was happening. Remember, I, I don't know if you know this by now. I live in Massachusetts because I did a geographic, and uh, my problems followed me. And they were all encased in here. And um, and so I got that was taken to this meeting. Meetings in Massachusetts are mainly in church basements. And um, that scared me, right? Churches and I and God. God and I had parted ways years ago um, over a very, several differences of opinion in our lives. And, um, and a couple of things that he did wrong to me 
you know, he'd taken a few people away from me that I didn't think it was their time to go. And, uh, and I was so pretty angry at God. And, uh, you know, so here I was getting sober in Massachusetts in, uh, in church basements. And, um, I spent much of my first year of sobriety listening to the choirs singing up above, you know, thinking God has found me. God has found me. This isn't good. And, um, I had no intention of doing most of these steps. You know, um, I just wanted something to be different. Um, and I wasn't even sure that quitting drinking was going to be different. Maybe moderation would be helpful. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted. What I didn't know is that when you looked at me, you saw my problem. You saw this hole in my gut that I walked around with. You saw me trying to put anything and everything in it as quickly and as fast as I could to hopefully feel a little bit of, you know, you know that breath you want to take without feeling like your heart's going to crawl out of your mouth at the same time? Like it was just an, ah, and I got that. I got that from that first drink. Or maybe I got it in the eighth drink. I wasn't really quite sure which drink it was going to be, so I had to keep taking drinks till I got. And then it just kept going. It just kept going. And, um, so I got to these rooms and, um, I heard, I heard a lot of things like, blah, 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 blah. God. Blah, 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 coffee. <laughs> Thank you for having cookies, right? Most of us go to meetings for cookies, right? I choose my meetings by their cookie selection. You know, I didn't hear a lot, but what I heard, I could do coffee. I couldn't do God. And I looked at those 12 steps that y'all had hanging on those pretty banners. It said one, two, and the traditions I didn't even pay attention to because they didn't even make sense to me. But those steps had a lot of God in them. And um, so I made a decision fairly early on that um, I wasn't going to do those, right, um, that I could possibly... Uh, do two or three of the steps seemed good to me um, but here's what happened it didn't matter whether I thought I could do the steps or not uh, I sat in these rooms and not just this room on Monday night on this room maybe Monday night then another AA room on another Monday night and another room on another Monday night and then I think I really can't go on Friday Saturday and Sunday because I have a lot of work to do I mean don't, don't, I was in school I had a lot of homework um, you know, so I sat in a different meeting every Wednesday night, you know, maybe this room Wednesday night, another room Wednesday night. Another. I never got to know you. You never got to know me. And I increasingly got to hate you, right? Because you'd go off in your little smoke breaks and you'd all, <laughs> you know, and I just, I, this was me. And you know who you are because you've done this. <laughs> I miss smoking, right? <laughs> and I'd do that, and I'd smoke as many as I could. And then I'd go sit in on the meeting, and then about 50 minutes of the meeting, I'd go back outside, and I'd... <sighs> all by myself. All by myself. And I was sure that you had all... I got sober in Massachusetts. You probably all got sober in Massachusetts, and you all knew each other, and then you all came in together, and you were all good friends, and I hated you, you know? And uh, and I lived like that. And I didn't know any better because I got to meetings late. I left I left late. I didn't stay. You know, I left for the prayer, but then I shot outside to have a cigarette, and then I shot along the way. And you sometimes I'd stay long enough to be invited to coffee at Friendly's, and I thought I'd have better things to do than have coffee with you at Friendly's, right? It's the equivalent of Village Inn and things like that. You know, that really bad A coffee that, that we are used to. And so um, I did that. And I kept drinking. And I kept drinking. And I kept drinking. And I didn't mean to keep drinking, folks. I did not mean to keep drinking. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I kept coming to meetings wanting to not drink. Wanting and wanting and wanting to not drink. You know, and they say, if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you're getting. And I keep gotten what I gotten. You know, I was getting up. I was just getting nothing. 
And, um, you know, I, uh, my last drink was on March 9th of 1990. And it was a, it was a, there was a, I got dragged to a meeting after locking myself in my dorm room, uh, by a couple of new alcoholics. And it was a one, two, three meeting. I remember nothing about it except I remember wanting to die. You know, I'm a coward, and I've said that to you before, and I just wanted God to give me the courage to do something to die, and I could not get that courage to die. I could not get it. And uh, alcohol just wasn't killing me fast enough. And, um, you know, I didn't do a lot of things that are strongly suggested. In fact, the book talks about them as being requirements, like the steps. You know, I didn't do them because I didn't think that I had to, right? Look around. Y'all look like some pretty sick people. That's what I thought. I didn't have to do what you did. And I found out that I had to do what you did to have what you have. I wanted five years sobriety at one day sober. You know, I had a bit of entitlement still left in me. You know, I couldn't tie my shoelaces. I didn't, couldn't eat. I couldn't brush my teeth. I looked like shit all the time, and I thought that I deserved something better than what you had. You know, and um, and I got a sponsor because it was, I was told that the whole thing, you keep doing what you're doing, you keep getting what you're getting, and I wasn't liking what I got. So I got the sponsor, um, and um, I, I was talking to Troy and Denise, and I said, most of my first years of sobriety, I don't really know what happens. I made up a lot of it, my first five, seven years of sobriety. So I ran up with my first sponsor who informed me that the story I'd been telling was wrong for about seven years. Um, but let me tell you, um, she read that book to me. A lot of it didn't make sense. And she read that book to me. She read that book to me. Uh, the, here's what I know, folks. In my first few years of sobriety, I never had to be any place alone if I didn't choose to be alone. I could always pick up a phone and call another alcoholic, and I'll tell you my phone story in just a minute. Um, I could always show up at my sponsor's house at any time of the day, and if she wasn't there, um, her girlfriend was there, I could smoke as much as I wanted in her house, and I liked that, you know? I could show up at a meeting any time. I lived close to other alcoholics. I never had to be alone doing that stuff. And I was crazy. I was crazy. I sat in these rooms and I rocked back and forth and I rocked back and forth and I used to just just pick at my skin and pick at my skin and pick at me and pull out my hair because I just wanted to be, be. I just wanted to be able to sit, you know. And um, so, uh, but my first couple of years of sobriety, the best I could do was show up, not drink, you know, help set up chairs, help clean up cigarette butts. We used real coffee cups at that time. I could do, I had to good clean coffee cups, you know. I, that's all I could do. And um, at about three years sober, I got well, right? It took two years of being crazy, and then one year I cleaned up, and I, I could look, I think I look good, right? I could look good. And so I thought. And so what happened is, is I stopped going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I went to one a week. And... um. I told everybody I was sober. I told everybody that I was a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. At five years sober, my sponsor asked me to stop telling people that. She leaned over one day and she said, Mayor, please don't tell anybody you're a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was also in the same week in which she said, you cannot transmit something you haven't got. You know, and uh, I have come to get it. And it's been a gift, but it's been a, a long, long road. And, um, you know, if you're wandering out there with some time behind you and you're feeling good about yourself and you're talking like I talk, the I, I, I's and the me, me, me's, you know, um, and, and you feel like you just have wind blowing through your gut, I know what that's like. You know, one meeting a week wasn't cutting it for me. And these poor guys used to sit and listen to me take apart the big book because I thought it was grammatically poorly structured. And that's all I talked about at that big book study. And they just laughed, right? They knew I was that, that, book, that person in the book, big book, that poor Sally whistling in the wind. I can't whistle. But I was that poor person just kind of white knuckling it through, holding on, holding on, holding on, you know, um, until the day came that I wished one more time I could die. 
I just want to die. This Alcoholics Anonymous might work for you, but it wasn't working for me. And, um, you know, <laughs> Troy loves it. My sponsor tells me even today, I don't know what program you're working, Marianne, but you might want to try Alcoholics Anonymous because it works for everybody else. And um, at about four years, so four years of not drinking, I moved to California. And boy, time has just flown right here because I'm just in California. And uh, But I moved to California. And, um, I, you know, what happened, folks, is that um, I'm in a relationship and I'm a terrible partner. I'm a terrible daughter. My family's asked me not to come home again uh, because every time I do, I'm picking fights with people. Um, and I'm just, I'm a, I'm a cranky, loudmouth baby. You know, I'm a victim of everything around me. And uh, so uh, they asked me not to do that. And about, and, and about this time, um, I'm just nuts. And um, I end up with this woman who ends up being my sponsor, uh, Lisa, Lisa P. Lisa, oh, she's got married V now. Lisa V. Who's Lisa Mraz. Now she's Lisa Vasquez. And uh, I just broke her anonymity. Um, she wouldn't mind. And uh, Lisa, uh, it was 1994. Lisa looked like she was coming out of uh, Flashdance, early 1980s, big hair. And I thought, oh, man, she's a pushover. And, uh, and we went on a honeymoon for 30 days, and then she put me to work. And she made me read that book again. And uh, she, was a, she worked a, a swing shifts. She got off at 11 o'clock. I was always sitting right outside her apartment by 11 o'clock when she got home uh, because I couldn't stand to be alone again. I couldn't stand to be with myself again. And, um, and she started going through this book with me. And we did, we started working these steps again. You know, I'm one of those people that thought, I did the steps. I understood them. I got them. What's the problem? I'm done. Right? I'm done. I can go on. I can live my life and I can live happily ever after. I didn't know that I had to do this on a daily basis. You know, and uh, so she took me through these steps again. And, and a couple of things have happened in my sobriety from that point. Um, and I, I did share this. You know, my, uh, and I share this all the time because it's so pivotal in my sobriety. Because God and I, at four years sober, were still not talking. He may have been talking. I was not listening. And I was not going to have a conversation with God. You know, I would do that third step prayer and pretend. Fake it, fake it, fake it, yes. God, you know, but God knew what I was saying. I won't say it here, but you know what I was saying to God. And, um, you know, um, what happened is, is that, um, uh, at, at, uh, five years in 1996, uh, my dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And, um, and many of you have heard this story, you know, but what happened is, is that Alcoholics Anonymous gave me the opportunity to finally start to clear away the wreckage of my past. And um, I was suggested that I go home and I try to be the daughter that I could never be before, you know. And uh, in July of 1996, I went home and uh, I said to my grandmother, is there, you know, I, I can stay home if you like. And she said, no, no, Miha, you go back to school. You know, my grandmother always thinking about me. And I said, no, really, I can stay home if you like and I can do anything you want, you know. She asked me to run their bar. Didn't flinch. Didn't think about any of the things I had ever done to them. And for the next four months, I ran their bar, and I didn't lick my fingers. <laughs> you know. And uh, when somebody gave me any hassle, I said, just wait till my grandmother gets here, because I'm a coward and my grandma will handle you. And... uh you know, when it came down to it, uh, my grandfather pulled me aside. Um, he has four children, you know, of, uh, older than me, and he pulled me aside and he said, you know, Miha, um, do you think I should get chemo or should I just let myself die in peace? You know, I said, Daddy, I don't want you to die, but I don't want you to suffer. And I'll do whatever it is you want me to do today, you know. And he chose not to have chemo, you know. And morphine made my dad nutty, you know. 
You know, sometimes he wasn't my dad, and uh, sometimes he'd tell me that the government was watching him because headline news runs every 20 minutes, and he was sure they weren't monitoring him every 20 minutes. He'd say, I saw that earlier. Like, yeah, Dad, you know, and, um, but I got to walk through all that with him. You know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one of the hardest things is that uh, having this child and uh, knowing, you know, and for once, you know, in my sobriety, I could give a gift to my grandfather that was priceless, you know? So I miss him, and I thank you, and now call it synonymous, for letting me hold his hand when he took his last breath, you know? There was nothing left between us. There was no, no angry words. There was nothing. He could go, and you taught me that God could walk with me to match calamity with serenity. I got it. I got it. And you gave that to me. You walked with me. My sponsor flew to Texas. She lived in California. She flew to Texas a week later after everything was done and everybody was gone. So I did not have to be alone so that my family could see Alcoholics Anonymous show up. And that's what you give into my family. You know? At 10 years sober, though, I got a little arrogant again. I forget quickly what kind of gifts you give me. And I got a girlfriend, and I got a house, and I got a job, and I got a car. It's a lot of work to maintain that stuff, if you know what I mean. You got to work hard to look good on the outside. You got to work hard to look good in Alcoholics. You got to sponsor a lot of women to look good in Alcoholics Anonymous. You got to go to district meetings to look good in Alcoholics Anonymous. They got kicked out of district meetings because they couldn't take it. You know? And I got crazy one more time, and a doctor said to me, maybe we should put you in some antidepressants. You know, some of us do have to seek outside help. And um, I'm going to have to tell you this quick, quickly is what happened is that at 10 years sober, you know, boom, I'm hit with me again. I'm hit with the reality that of a myself, I am nothing. I am big, fat, arrogant, schmuck loser is what I am. And I walk around being that person on pages 60 to 63. I'm a, I'm a producer of confusion rather than harmony. I want you here. No, there. Oh, there. No. You know, move, 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 move. Give me, give me, give me, give me. Where's mine? Where's mine? Where's mine? I live like that, you know, and I couldn't understand why I was wound so tightly. And I went to my sponsor, Lisa, and I said, they want to put me on drugs. I want to die. I don't know what to do. I'm sponsoring women. I'm being of service. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm doing, ay, 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 right? And she said, Mary, I don't think I can help you anymore. Now, this woman gave me another gift. I have no ownership over the women who come into my life. I just give them what I have. I give freely of what I've been given so that they may freely give of what's been given to them. And the day comes when we may have to part. And she said, I cannot help you anymore. But I know somebody who can. And that's my current sponsor today. <laughs> and I went to this woman who lived in Blythe. She now lives in another part of uh, California. But I drove two hours. I lived in Arizona. I drove two hours to see this woman because she said she needed to see me eyeball to eyeball. You know what that's like, eyeball to eyeball. It's very important. And uh, she looked at me and she said, I know what your problem is. I was like, God, you put the cart before the horse. <laughs> yeah, what does that mean? Put the cart, what, what does that have to do with the fact that I want to die? You know? I had put all material before all per, all spiritual. I had put houses and girls and cars and jobs and all these things that I thought made me look good. I put it all before God and Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's very hard to keep it all together, you know. And she took me to that, the women I've sponsored who might be here tonight know I love this page on the 12 and 12 on page 76. The chief activator. You know what chief activator means, Marianne? Yes. Right? I don't know. Maybe. 
Right? The chief activator of our defects of character is self-centered fear. You're living in self-centered fear. The fear of losing something you have or the fear of not getting something you want. What are you afraid to lose and what are you afraid you're not going to get? Everything. And that's what it was. It was everything. You know, it was everything. And, um, you know, I had to work really hard to get back on that AA spiritual beam. She'd say to me, didn't we just talk about this last week? I feel like she'd grab me by the scruff of my neck and put me back up, and the minute she let go, I'd just plop off again, right? Because I just was like, yes, I want God, I want God. Oh, but that job, you know, I just couldn't stay focused. I couldn't stay focused, and, uh, you know, I love my sponsor because she's not been very nice to me. If you're nice to me, I'll take whatever is in your pockets, you know. And so she had to be very clear with me about what was to happen next. I was 10 years sober and I had a color every day. I thought I was too good for that. I thought I was too well for that. But I'd sit in the parking lot of my job because I was afraid to go inside because the receptionist didn't like me. I put all of myself on the receptionist who didn't care about me. It wasn't that she didn't like me. She just didn't care whether I walked through the door or not. You know? But I had such fear of walking by her. You know? I had to go make amends to her for that. My sponsor makes me make amends to people who I talk about for assassinating the good character of their name. I try not to talk about people, you know? My sponsor has told me that the only way that I'm going to live and grow is to expand my spiritual life. You know, ten years of running around in Alcoholics Anonymous to find out that the thing you told me when I walked through those doors was the thing that I had to start to do at ten years sober. You didn't give me a new book for achieving ten years of sobriety. You didn't tell me that I could stop reading the 12 and 12. You didn't tell me that I didn't have to sit with newcomers anymore. You didn't tell me all that stuff. You told me the same thing at ten years sober that you told me the day I walked into these rooms. You told me the same thing at 19 years sober that you told me the day I walked into these rooms. Burn into the consciousness of every man and woman that I must trust God and clean house. If I do these steps, if I take direction, I will clear away the wreckage of my past. I will find a God of my understanding. I will abandon myself to God as I understand God. And God and I, you know, some days, you know, my prayer is kind of like, God, I hope you're there, you know. But most of the time, I know he is, you know, because I live with deep-seated fear. I'm afraid to fly. I'm afraid of strangers. I'm, I, I won't give you my fear list, but you get the idea. There are a lot of things I'm still afraid of. And so I have to ask God every moment of my waking day to walk me through that fear. Some nights I wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning because I hear a noise on the monitor and I'm sure somebody's broken into the house and is stealing my baby and I want to jump out and run down the stairs and check. And I have to lie there and say, God, I probably need to sleep tonight. Please, can we get through this with some sleep? And some nights... I'll walk downstairs just to make sure because I'm going to beat the whoever it is stealing my baby. And some nights I can close my eyes and be assured the grace of God can do for me what I cannot do for myself. Right? And that is to grow in the likeness of my creator. That's to be of service to you and to Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. That's to do all the things that I thought were impossible when I walked in here. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your patience. I want to thank you for your love. I want to let, thank you for letting me show up even when it was clear that I did not want to be here sitting next to you. I want to thank you for my family and my sobriety and a God that I hope continues to grow. And thank you for being here tonight.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.